pleasure to welcome you to our church online here at Hamilton Baptist. Good morning church family and a special warm welcome to you if you're joining us here at Hamilton Baptist online for the first time. We gather again this morning online as the Reverend Alan Donaldson comes and brings God's word to us in the second of our God Is series. This morning we'll be focusing on God is righteous. Before that we'll have our kids talk from Paul Downey, we'll be led by our worship team and we trust that you will be blessed, encouraged and challenged by all that is shared this morning. So just as we come and open this time together, I'd like to read the words of Exodus 15 verse 2, and it reads this, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Glorious words as we open our worship service this morning. Whatever this finds you today, whatever day you are watching this, whenever you find this, would you know that God is your strength for all who believe in the Lord Jesus? And indeed, he has become our salvation. And because of that, we will praise him and exalt him. I pray that whatever this week has looked like for you, that you would come this morning with expectancy in your heart and joy in your heart, knowing that sadly still physically distanced, we are gathering in one spirit as God's people this morning. So before we hand to our worship team, shall we just bow our heads and we'll commit our morning to the Lord. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we come together again, privileged to be your people thankful to be your people, knowing that it is not something of our work, but something that is the gift of salvation, a free gift given to us from the Lord God. And as we come again in this way, after many, many weeks of doing so, Lord, would we still come with fire in our bellies? Would we come to praise you, to exalt you, to learn something new of who you are? Lord, as Alan opens the word for us, as we focus on what it means that God is righteous, would you speak to the very core of our being? We thank you that we can gather. We come into your presence this morning in anticipation for all that you will do in us and through us. We pray all of these things in Christ Jesus, holy, wonderful, and lovely name. Amen. We'll now hand over to our worship team. Thank you. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a
as if they were on a ladder. When they're on top and they think they're better than everybody else, they look down on everyone beneath them and treat them really badly because they think they're like the kings or queens of the world. And there are others who are at the bottom of the ladder, or so they think, because they look at other people and think that everyone is better than them. So they feel really sad and sometimes wonder if their life is worth living. But you know, the ladder is a really bad way of thinking about yourself and other people. Because there are those who spend their whole life trying to have a better car, a better house, a better job, a better husband or wife, and of course, better children. But no matter how high they climb the ladder, there is always someone who is higher than them. And there are other people who don't feel so good about themselves, but they very quickly learn, no matter how low they think they are on the ladder, there are always people worse than them. So you see, the ladder isn't really a good model for, uh, for how to feel good about ourselves or how to feel bad about other people. In fact, the Bible goes further. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means God sets the standard, God sets the test, and every one of us fail because none of us is good enough. So God says that actually we're at the bottom of the ladder because nothing we will ever do will meet the test. In fact, as far as he's concerned, there is no ladder at all and all of us are equal before him. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Fell asleep a little bit there. Jesus also told another story about a party. A party where lots of people were invited. And he said, imagine you were invited and you came into that party and you saw the best seat in the house. A bit like this one. And you thought to yourself, I'm going to sit there because I'm cool, I'm nice, I'm happening, I'm in with the in crowd, I'm worth it. So you came and you sat down. But imagine this. Imagine the host of the party came and tapped you on the shoulder and said, I'm sorry, this seat is saved for someone who's better than you. Can you please go and sit somewhere else? Could you imagine how it would feel to have to get up from your seat and walk through the crowd at that party, the whole crowd, to get to the worst seat in the house? Oh dear, that's right. It's this seat here, next to the bins. And could you imagine what it'd be like to go from the best seat in the house to the worst? To have all those people looking at you and snickering and laughing and mocking behind you. Look at them, they thought they were someone special and now, ha, they're sitting beside the bins. It would feel awful. But let's change it up a second. What would happen if you came into that party and instead of sitting at the best seat in the house, you sat here at the worst one? What would happen if the host would see you, would tap you on the shoulder and say, what are you doing sitting there? You're my best friend. Come with me and sit at the best seat in the house. Imagine how that would feel. Imagine walking through that crowd of people, the host at your side, everybody looking at you, everybody thinking, wow, they must be someone really special. You see, Jesus was trying to make a very important point. When we think we're something special and we're better than everyone else, when it gets to the point when we think that we don't even need God at all, we won't receive a blessing from him. In fact, one day he will pull us down from our high place. But if we come to God feeling like we're the bottom rung of the ladder and we need him and we need his help, then he will raise us up because he came to save people like that. As it says in our verses for today, all of you should be very humble with each other. God is against the proud but gives grace to the humble. Be humble under God's powerful hands so he will lift you up when the right time comes. Give all your worries to him because he cares for you. So if you worry today about not being good enough, I've got good news for you. You're not. But when you come to God 
and admit that you are at the bottom rung of the ladder and you need his help, then he will lift you up. God bless. Thank you, Paul, for engaging us in the way that you do in your children's talk this morning. Thank you. Uh, really just one thing to update you on this morning, and that is the exciting news that we are gearing up to get back into church. At the moment, our plans are geared towards uh, coming back for our Wednesday night prayer meetings. And once we've had a couple of weeks to work through that, we're hoping to come back into the building. So the date for your diaries is Wednesday the 7th of October and in due course we'll let you know uh, how our booking system will work and everything else that goes with that. But please pray for us as we continue to make the final changes and put the final things into place. But we're excited, uh, again hoping that we are able to do so with the ever changing government guidelines. But the plan for the moment is to resume uh, gathering together here in the main church. Uh, we'll look to stream on YouTube the first 10 or 15 minute reflection, then we'll close that off and we'll have a gathered time of prayer. So just before Alan opens up the word to us, so we just come, bow our heads and pray. Lord God, as we come into your presence this morning, we just want to thank you for who you are. We want to thank you for your glory. We want to thank you for your grace and your mercy that you lavish upon us. We want to thank you that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, into this world, not because you had to, but because you so loved this world. And God, as we gather in this way, would you speak to each of our hearts this morning? Would your warmth, as the power of the word is unleashed as it is preached this morning, Lord, would your word do a transforming work in each of our hearts. We take a moment as well just to pray for our nation. The ever-changing COVID situation that is around us, we continue to ask and pray for wisdom for all our country's leaders. But more than that, Lord, we ask that our nation would see you. There are so many things we see, so many things that sadden us in our country. So many things that confuse us, so many things that stand against the principles of the word of God. But Lord, we ask that this would be a time when you would empower us with your boldness. That we would go into this world wearing the armour of God as your people. With no fear of hostility or anything else because we know that the Lord Jesus lives in us and works through us by his mighty spirit. And Lord, as we uh, come to our plans to resume services back here in the church, as we gather again uh, on Wednesday evenings, Lord, would you bless all of those plans? We pray that we will be able to do so. And we just pray for the team that are putting all the final things in place for that, that you'd just be with them, that you'd guide them in everything that they need to do. So Lord, as we open the word now, would you speak clearly, concisely to our hearts? Would we leave this morning knowing that we have learned something new of who the Lord Jesus is. So God, we thank you for our time this morning, that we're able to do this in this way, and we commit it, all of our time into your hands. Amen. We'll now hand over to Alan. Good morning, Hamilton Baptist Church. It's lovely to be back with you uh, again, preaching from God's Word, and we're going to read it together just now. We're starting our Bible reading in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and we're going to read verse 3 and 4. That's Deuteronomy chapter 32 and reading verse 3 and 4. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. How glorious is our God. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright he is. We're then going to turn to the New Testament, to the Sermon on the Mount, where we're going to read a few verses together. We begin in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 and 10. God blesses those who hunger 
and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. And then verse 10, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And then if you turn with me over the page to chapter 6 and to verse 33, we read these words. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. And our final reading is found in chapter 7 of Matthew and verse 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Amen. And we'll unpack these words of scripture in a few moments. God is righteous. That's the topic of the sermon this morning as we unpack some of the scriptures we read just a few moments ago. To say that God is righteous is to say that God has standards, standards which he has set for himself, standards which he conforms to. The idea of having standards to conform to is something that we are absolutely familiar with at this time of pandemic in the world. We have standards that have been passed on to us that we are asked to adhere to, behavioural patterns that we are asked to keep and we all know what happens when people go outside of those behaviour patterns. We've been told that if we want to stay safe and protect others and save lives, then we need to remember the facts. We need to wear those face coverings when we are in certain places. We need to avoid crowded places. We need to clean our hands regularly and wash them for, for 20 seconds or more. We need to observe at most times a two meter rule and if we have symptoms, we are told to self-isolate. We become familiar with those as the standards of behaviour for this current period of history. And we know that if we follow these standards that have been set for us by Jason Leach, the Secretary of Airdrie Baptist Church and, and others, that if we follow those standards and we trust the person who set those standards, then we are on solid ground. And as a nation, we have been trusting Professor Jason Leach. We've trusted him because he has been honest. We've trusted him because he has been frank in his conversations. And he has told us what it is going to be like if we don't follow the rules. We know what it is to keep standards. And so God says to us, he is righteous and he has righteous standards that must be kept. John Piper describes God's righteousness in this way. An unwavering commitment to the highest standard imaginable. An unwavering commitment to the highest standard imaginable. Let me tell you a story of what happened once when I was in school teaching an RE lesson. Somebody asked the question in the class, how good do you need to be to be a Christian? I decided to answer the question in this way. I said to the class, think about the person who has done the most good in this world. They had a whole list of them. Some of them included rather beautifully their granny and things like that. But the most common answer was Mother Teresa. They all knew about Mother Teresa and the good she had done for the poor in India. So we put her at the top of our list. I then asked them to think of the person who had done the least good in the world. The first kid came up with Hitler and nobody wanted to disagree with that. So Hitler went to the bottom of our list. I then asked them, how good do you think we need to be to be good enough for God's standards? 
well, they all had us up by Mother Teresa or just a little bit lower. But of course, the reality is that God's standards are off the scale. They're nowhere near Mother Teresa's standards. They're, they're way, way above it. And when we think of God as righteous, we can almost not consider what it's like in terms of human righteousness. He is above and beyond anything that we can imagine. But the Bible does describe some people as righteous. People who had an unwavering commitment to God's highest standards. In fact, interestingly enough, there are three people who are mentioned as being righteous in the birth narratives of Jesus. Let's look at them just briefly. Firstly, let's look at Simeon. Luke chapter 2 verse 25 describes Simeon as righteous and devout. He was living to the highest standards. We don't know much about Simeon, but we know that he was waiting for the arrival of Israel's king. You remember we spoke about that in last week's sermon, that whole intertestamental period when people were waiting for the God's presence to come and fill the temple. Simeon was one of them and he was devout in his waiting. He had faith in the promises of God and whatever he was doing, however he was going to live, it was living with a view that one day his king would return. And because of his righteousness, God chooses him to bless Jesus and to bless Mary and Joseph. Imagine that, being able to hold Jesus, the Son of God, in your arms and pray a blessing on him. What a character of righteousness Simeon must have had. The second person in the story of Jesus' birth who's described as righteous is Joseph. We find that in Matthew chapter 1 verse 19. He is a righteous man who is unwilling to disgrace Mary who he has discovered is pregnant and not to him the fiancé. And he is, we're told that he wants to guard Mary's reputation. And that is the example of righteousness. He knows the rules, he knows the laws, but his way of interpreting these laws in guarding Mary's reputation is what captures the meaning of righteousness in his life. We can contrast him to some of the leaders of Israel that Jeremiah describes back in Jeremiah 23 and verse 1. They were people who were destroying and scattering the people. They were dealing with them so harshly. But here is Joseph who is dealing with the laws of God with a heart of grace and a heart of compassion and love. It's no wonder that Jesus, who he brings up as his son, when he finds a woman caught in the act of adultery, deals with that woman in a very similar way to how his father was willing to deal with Mary. In quietness, with a few words, with a sense of perspective and guidance and no condemnation. No public humiliation. Jesus deals righteously with a woman who has been caught in adultery. And the third person that is described as righteous in the birth narratives of Jesus is John the Baptist. Strangely, if you read in Matthew 21, which is not part of the birth narratives, but Matthew 21 verse 32, Jesus tells us that John demonstrated righteousness in the way that he lived. He showed us how to live righteously. Now John's probably best known for the things he said. He was a voice in the desert. But it's not the voice that Jesus is focusing on. It's the demonstration of lifestyle. And what do we know about John the Baptist? 
Well, we know he spoke the truth. We know he denounced those who went astray. But we also know that he led a very simple life, eating locusts and honey, dressing simply. He had few possessions, but he did all that God required of him. He was obedient to God. There was something in his lifestyle that could be described as righteous. We'll come back to those three examples of righteousness in a little while. But for now, let's return to our text today. Our main text is found in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. And like last week, this is really a psalm, although it's in the book of Deuteronomy. It is a song of Moses Words that he taught to a tune that people could sing along for generations to come so they could learn the truths contained within it. In fact, I also learned this as a song as a child. Maybe you did too. Ascribe greatness to our God the Rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, good and upright is he. That's the the song that I know from this song of Moses. And it's a song that describes what righteousness is. It doesn't even use the word righteousness, but it unpacks its meaning. His deeds are perfect. There is no deeds better than his deeds, no deeds wiser than his deeds, no deeds kinder than his deeds, no deeds more hopeful, more loving, more just. His are the most fair way of dealing with people. That is righteousness, the perfection of all that he does. And he's described as a rock Of course, when we think of a rock, we think of something that's absolutely solid and immovable, a foundation that we can build on. But for the people of Israel who are coming out of the desert at this time, a rock was also a place of protection, a place of shelter from the storm. You could get in behind the rock, you could hide behind it, the dust and sand could blow over. It was a place of shade in the beating hot sun where you could sit in relative cool. And of course, in their story in the wilderness, the rock was a place of food and refreshment, even in times of disobedience when the rock was struck and the water came forth. The rock spoke to them of so much, but above all else, the rock was not sand. The rock was not shifting sand. It was not moving all around the place. You could navigate by rocks. And God's righteousness is something that we can navigate by. God's righteousness does not change. His perfect deeds do not change because culture changes or times change. His righteousness is faithful, dependable. He is a promise keeper. But let's unpack a little more of the context of this song of Moses because it's not simply a song. Moses in using this is using a format that is recognised widely across the ancient Near East at this time. He's using a pattern to write this song and the pattern is what we call a declaration of guilt or a broken treaty pattern. Back in that day, nations, big nations, would sign treaties alongside small nations. The empire nation would be known as a suzerain and the little nation would be known as a vassal. And a suzerain-vassal treaty would be drawn up as to how each nation would look after one another. Normally the suzerain would say, we will look after you if you, the vassal, Give all your allegiance to us, send us troops to go to war and send us taxes. But when that treaty was broken, when that little vassal nation decided to go off and start a relationship with another country, then the suzerain nation would come along 
and would claim that they had done wrong. And there was a pattern for that. And this is the pattern that Moses follows. And it makes sense because the covenant agreement between the Lord God Almighty, who we know as Yahweh, the King of all creation, he had a covenant with this little vassal nation of Israel. And that covenant set the agreement for the relationship, but it had been broken because Israel had started looking to idols. And so Moses uses this ancient pattern to describe Israel's failure and falling away from the righteous God. So in verse 1, he calls witnesses, and what greater witnesses are there than the witnesses of heaven and earth, the everlasting pillars? By verses 2 through verse 4, he's talking about the wonderful great treaty keeper that is the Lord God Almighty, this God who is king, this God who is righteous, who has done nothing wrong. By verse 5, we're into the accusation, which really unpacks itself in verses 15 through to 18, where they, they talk about the foreign gods and the unfaithfulness of Israel. And verses 19 through to 33 really expresses the grief of God at such behaviour. And then verse 34 to 43 is the judgment of God. Now, of course, every time we look at when ancient writers like Moses use ancient traditions like this, we're not really looking at what is the same as the ancient treaties. We're looking at what is different because it's in what is different that we see something of the amazement of God. And what is different about this response is verse 43. Verse 43 is the twist in the tale. The story should end that God is going to wipe Israel from the face of the earth because they have broken his covenant, they have broken his agreement, they have gone off and chased foreign gods, they have worshipped idols. But the twist in the tale is that God does not do that. That his heart is not full of punishment but that there is grace and mercy in his heart. In the New Testament, we're going to read this same story again when Jesus teaches the parable of the loving father or the prodigal son. The story should end that the son is turned away and sent back to his nothingness and his empty life. But we know that what happens is he finds a father who loves him and who greets him and who welcomes him in. And we discover in this passage of scripture that the righteous king is merciful. In the New Testament that the righteous king is the loving father. Moses' song is here to teach us about righteousness. It's here to teach us about God's high, high standards of perfection when he deals with people. But it is not standards that are without mercy and grace. What does that mean for us today? Well, firstly, I think it should bring us great comfort. All his ways are always just and good. God will never treat you or I unfairly. When the woman was caught in the act of adultery, she experienced mercy in the face of righteousness. We are not God's enemies. We will not be treated as his enemies. We who follow Christ by faith, are his children who are loved. And even when we go in our wayward ways and his righteousness shows us up for what we are, he will still show mercy because mercy is an aspect of his righteousness. Notice Simeon is comforted by righteousness. He has waited 
for the coming of the king, for the coming of this baby to the temple. He's been waiting for the promise of God to be fulfilled, for all righteousness to be fulfilled. And now when he holds that righteousness in his arms, he knows the comfort that he can, as scriptures say, die in peace. God's comfort is for you. It is solid. It is unchanging. So often you may have heard his righteousness preached as something that condemns. And it does condemn our life and the sin in our life. But never lose the fact that in his righteousness is great and deep mercy. In the Old Testament law, in the prophetic teaching and also in the New Testament. There is comfort for us. God is unchanging. He will bring you his peace. He will bring you his love, even when you fall far from his unrighteousness. The second thing, it should give us confidence. Confidence in him who can do no wrong. You know, people do wrong primarily because we are selfish. We do wrong out of self-interest. We do wrong to our neighbour because, well, to do right to them might mean we become less. We do wrong to our work colleagues because, well, we want to rise up the ladder maybe ahead of them or we think of ourselves as better than them. The self is always at the heart of sin. It was at the heart of sin in the Garden of Eden when Eve wanted to have that knowledge for herself. If we go back to Joseph, the living father of Jesus, the one who would bring him up as his son, he was described as righteous And we see in that righteousness that he wasn't willing to put himself first. He also would have been disgraced. But more disgraced by marrying Mary. But it was his righteousness that meant he didn't disgrace Mary. He didn't put himself first. His righteousness was all about surrendering self. If we go back to Jeremiah 23, the unrighteous leaders who scatter and destroy the people of God, they are self-seeking. They're trying to improve their own lot, the Pharisees similarly. But in verse 5 and 6 of Jeremiah 23, we are told that the good king will save you and keep you safe. The good king is the one who looks out for the others and not for themselves. The good king is Jesus who surrenders his life for the world that we might be forgiven our unrighteousness and be made righteous before God. We can have confidence in God because he is faithful. He can do no wrong and he is not selfish like us and so he will never put himself above us. He loves us. And so he pours out his son for us. We can have confidence in him. And finally, there is a challenge here. A a challenge that reaches right into the heart of the church. And a challenge that reaches right into our own hearts as people who seek to be described as righteous one day. And we see it in the life of John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist's life of righteousness stood out from the crowd. Everyone knew that John was righteous. Jesus unpacks it in his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, he talks about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice or for righteousness. Is that us? Are we known for our hunger and thirst for justice, for righteousness? Are we the ones who are fighting for debt relief, for those who have got into financial difficulties, 
Are, are we fighting for those who find themselves in food poverty and recognize that the, the, the rich poor divide in our nation is catastrophic to the well-being and to the coming of God's kingdom? Do we know the difference between those who have been led astray and those who are leading people astray? And does that affect the way that we deal with them? When we read the story of the Samaritan woman in John 4, do we condemn her for her uh, sexual prevalence with having five husbands and the man she now lived with was not her husband? Or do we recognise that the only women you will find like that in our time are women who have been abused, who have run from one husband to another to another, running away, fleeing sexual violence and hatred against them. Do we know the difference? Because righteousness knows the difference. We've seen that in the Song of Moses. We've seen it in the life of Jesus. We see it in the prophet's teaching in Jeremiah. We see it in these people engaged in the birth of Jesus. Do we hunger and thirst for righteousness Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, it says in Matthew 5.10. Is that you? Are you someone persecuted because you refuse to compromise your righteousness? You refuse to not stand up for the weak. You refuse to let a, a beggar lie on the street untended, uncared for, unloved? Are you known for your righteousness? Matthew 6 verse 33, a little further on in the Sermon on the Mount says, hey, don't worry about money and possessions because he's been saying for the past few verses, money and possessions are a distraction to right living. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness he says as he's drawing that sermon to a conclusion and it helps us to draw this sermon to a conclusion seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness the king has a kingdom the righteous God's kingdom has a righteous lifestyle with an unimaginably perfect view of living. There's comfort there for us. There is a God of mercy who loves us and in his righteousness will always treat us fairly, will always treat us wonderfully well. There is confidence there for us that he is secure, he is a rock, he is our shelter. In storm, he is something to build our life upon. He's not like the shifting sand and he's not going to change. And neither are his standards going to change. But there's a challenge there. The church is so far away from meeting his standard. So far from casting away our money and possessions and caring for the poor. So full of ourself and our pride that unlike Joseph, we're not willing to lose our reputation for the sake of the other. We are called to righteous living, like Joseph, like Simeon, like John the Baptist, a righteousness that stands out in this world of not being self-centered, but being other-centered and giving up all that we are so that his kingdom might come in all its righteous fullness. Amen. Alan, thank you for your word for us this morning. To the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, stay safe, God bless, and we'll see you soon.
Yeah. 